Guten Tag, hello everyone. Ich bin Anja Gottwald and auf dem bunten Stuhl today is Rob Elston. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being my guest. Um, I'm honored to have you. Um, instead of introducing Rob, I think I might just hand over and explain what brings you to Zürich and maybe like um, fixing this, I mean, bringing this together with your biography. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, as you know, my name is Rob and I was born in the, in the US. Um, and I, I was born in a, in, a, in a white suburban town and I had an amazing family, my brother and my parents. And I, sa I start there because I think my formative years are quite important to, to my story. So I'll say this, I loved reading, I loved the arts, mm -hmm. I was first interested in playing saxophone in probably fifth grade. Okay. We all started on either the clarinet or the flute or the trumpet or trombone. And I very quickly wanted to play the sax. And so music has always been a part of me. And in high school and in college, I was also involved in things like show choir and jazz mm -hmm. band and sure. marching band. I mm -hmm. conducted the marching band. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, a, that was a blast. And then in uni, in university and college, I studied business and I minored in German. Okay, can I, do, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Okay. How comes that you were ending up, so to speak, like uh, leading a band? I mean, isn't that mm. a teacher's job usually? Yeah, in tandem with the, ah, okay. the, the drum major. All right. Yes. Okay. And I was in the, the middle, there's this nice steel podium and I'm on the 50 yard line and it's Friday night lights and the stands are full of parents and other kids. And it was like a, like a playground for us in high school and in middle school. It was like the place to be. Mm -hmm. And it was very, yeah, nostalgic for many people in my, in my suburban area and fellow cities mm -hmm. close by. Okay. Yeah. So you had first experiences of, well, I, first and also in that not only leading stuff in organizing and also like leading peers and yeah. getting peers to do what you want them to do basically. Yeah. Um, but also in all sorts of arts. I mean, at least like the music and reading and, and stuff. Absolutely. And it's plays and musicals. And, yeah. And it, is your family, do you, do you have a family music background as well? Or is this just, did this come more from the school side? <laughs> it was, to answer your question, no. We don't have much of a family background. My mom's a, a very nice singer. Um, and my dad played the, the quads, the drums cool. in school. Yep, and he was a huge music fan. I attribute a lot of my knowledge about the classic rock to him, mm -hmm. like the Beatles and Al Stewart and Eric Bird and the Animals and all these beautiful, Harry Chapin. And my brother and I started when we were probably seven and nine mm -hmm. to act. Mm -hmm. And we just did it on a whim, went to our local community theater Cool. Yeah, and my brother was actually Hansel in Hansel and Gretel and Charlie and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, really? So he was the actor. Cool. Yeah, and I was the supporting roles and just loved, loved those summers filled with lunches and, 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 and like real camaraderie when you spend mm -hmm. oh, a yeah. whole day for two weeks with, yeah, yeah, yeah. or a month with, with, with peers. And that's what, that's what kind of got me, got me hooked. It was in part my brother and in part the, the real sense of community. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit um, on the, I mean, how this was organized? Obviously, like Europe, or at least continental Europe and, mm. and the US or the Anglo-Saxon world are a little bit differently organized concerning, especially summers. I, well, mm. you probably know, know this from studying German. And um, um, we don't have those massive summer holidays. We have like five or six weeks in Switzerland. It's five weeks in Germany, it's six weeks. So you do go to summer camps, but it's mm -hmm. not that that you take on like massive and big projects. Right. So okay. how, who organized stuff like this, and who would participate? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. Firstly, I would say the community of mm -hmm. our small suburban town. It's called Aurora, Aurora, mm -hmm. Ohio. We had a library, and it was next to the library in the mm -hmm. same building. Oh, cool. And so many of our community theaters. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
they host events like this, mm -hmm. workshops, do a play in a month with a group of kids, okay. do two plays in a month with two groups of kids. So I would say the, the kind of the structure of society mm -hmm. kind of builds it, builds it in. Mm -hmm. So it might also vary like from neighborhood to neighborhood, how much is offered or what, what, what kids can, can, uh, can experience. Well, yeah. I have, well, we do have, well, I mean, you should, obviously we do have summer camps and, and, and stuff um, in Europe as well. I had um, yeah, a lot of experiences like, or yeah, some experiences like this with my church, um, mm. which was a very active liberal Catholic church. We did also like plays and whatnot and like lots cool. of freedom and sports and whatnot over the, the two weeks we went to somewhere. And um, I remember from my childhood when I want to know how I was when I was 12 years old, I just have to say, oh, it was Dornburg, Erfnoff, Switzerland, Belgium, Italy. Ah, the one in Italy. Okay, this is what I did there. <laughs> so it's like your, it's landmarks in your development mm. as a, as a, old kid, young adult, adolescent, yeah. whatever, right? Like milestones. That you yes, can yes. Stuff remember. that you easy, more easily remember than any given March somewhere, mm. like right. or April. What happened in April? I don't know. Mm. Um, no, all right, but I interrupted you. So That's you fine. had, you had, um, but how, and how was, how was like the science and math and whatever part? I mean, <clears> is, I mean, sorry for the indiscreet question. Not at all. <laughs> That's fine. I uh, did. I did. I did well in those in those areas. I really picked up math well and enjoyed the homework. I uh, enjoyed trigonometry. I really had great teachers in math, mm -hmm. and I would attribute my success and love of that genre to them, as well as in science. I had some mm -hmm. fantastic teachers, and many of whom I'm still in touch with today. Oh, cool. Yeah, and. We had advanced placement classes mm -hmm. uh, for science and math and um, really being challenged to not be spoon fed mm -hmm. the material, mm -hmm. but rather one of my teachers named was Dr. Munson. He said, think the chemistry. Mm -hmm. He always said, think the chemistry. If I asked him a, is it, is it nationics or titrations? He would say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he had a, a real great reputation of, of ticking us off by answering these questions. But now, looking back, it was it was amazing teaching. Yeah, use your brain first. Absolutely. And um, Google later. Mm -mm. I mean, there is something between the ears to be used before, yeah. Mm. So, uh, we are entering university now. What happens? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I started as a, a German major. Oh. Yeah, um, kind of funny story how I started in German. Really wasn't a push in school. There was about half a German class and half a French class and six Spanish classes. Oh, yep. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Due to our proximity, probably, to the Mexico sure. and the Americas. And before that, when I was 11 in 2004, just about, yep, 11, 12 years old, we had a foreign exchange student who came from Munich, Germany. And one day my dad brought home a packet of faces and bios and he said, we're getting a let. Let's get an exchange student, cool. and it was a nine-month deal. And we sifted through the pages and people from France and Spain and Germany, and we landed on Clemens. And Clemens lived with us for nine months, and he was fifteen, my brother thirteen, me eleven, and so oh. he had another older brother. Absolutely, that's exactly how I see it. And we we played video games and went traveling and. Ich habe gedacht, ich muss diese Sprache des Clemens lernen. I, I thought I had to learn Clemens's language because of how much of a role model he was to me. All right. Yeah. What was, what was it? I mean, you just said like you played video games, you went traveling, and video games is not so much. I mean, what was it about him that was a role model for you? Because yeah. video games is, you can't just get any one from the street, right? Mm. You, yeah. Mm. So. I would say his maturity and his difference in the way he he stood, the way that he spoke, it seemed all very foreign and I think a great word to sum it would be exotic. Cummins was exotic to me as an 11 year old. This person coming to live with us and from this foreign country 
and he was extremely intelligent in school. He was a great ahead because German school prepared him really well. People in high school loved him and he was very kind. He was very hospitable, uh, always included me when I asked him, hey, what's that you're writing or what's that you're drawing? He's now a designer. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, Clemens oozed swagger. This guy was just Mr. Cool to me <laughs> as a, uh, uh, you know, sixth, seventh grader. Cool. Um, so it was like his, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to understand it. It was like, that he was very well accepted in school and liked and um, good sports guy. Yeah. Yep. I think he was just a stand up guy in general. All right. I really look for. I yeah. Really okay. I think that's something that might be might be a point. Like role modeling. Well, I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting question. What what children of this age are drawn to, right? Mm -hmm. And you obviously obviously got some virus of of getting your shoulders back and stand up and whatever. I mean, what Absolutely. whatever Clemens did. So. Yeah. That's a nice thing that you saw there, obviously. Yeah, I mean, he, he did what he said and he meant what he said. He did what he said and he meant what he said. Well, that's something we could easily get into for a few... What would Clemens have said about, like... Well, no, let's rephrase it. Um, were you confronted already at this time with like the peak PC culture, politically correct culture, as it is today? No. In... Would you would you have would you have a guess how you would have reacted? Mm. I know it's it's a bit sure. of a stretch of imagination. And it's just like yeah, that's fine. I think what there is a few instances where you know things could have gone two ways. They could have been poorly handled like conversations with the family and what Clemens wanted to do, what I wanted to do, what my brother Joey wanted to do. Uh, I would say the respect mm -hmm. for other people's opinions mm -hmm. was very strong mm -hmm. with Clemens and his willingness to learn what's, how do we sit at the dinner table? Mm -hmm. How do we open doors mm -hmm. and comparing that to his culture mm -hmm. and wiping away his slate to then assimilate very quickly mm -hmm. was know, just so honorable. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, yeah, interesting, very interesting. Because we, I mean, we, we Germans do have a reputation for being rather to the point and mm. well, and open and um, outspoken and mm. um, even within like the German speaking countries, Austria is a lot more, well, at least that's my perception, is a lot more polite and not so direct. And the Swiss are, well, always neutral. Mm -hmm. You hardly can ask him about the weather, whether it's good or not, because what is good for you as a tourist, a blue sky might not be good for the farmer next door who's mm -hmm. waiting for rain. And I'm serious about that. Yeah. So um, we were all trained, like especially after World War II, we were very trained very much to try to challenge things and uh, speak your truth so to speak so it was it would have been interesting to see what what he would encounter today in colleges and um, whatever where you have like your safe rooms and psychological counseling after having some speech from some outsider mm, mm, mm. in case you have been challenged anyways it would be yeah um all right we're still at university yes yes so after beginning as a German major, I I really want to actually just wrap up the Clemens slot really quickly yeah, yeah, with sure. the German uh, beginnings because it's a huge thread in my life mm -hmm. um, and really had me discover my love for cultures and my knack for language. I was one morning I was showering before school and my school started at least forty minutes after high school where Clemens and Joey attended, and I was in the shower much earlier than I used than I usually would would shower and you know 
I think this is a great example of what I loved about Clemens was he called me out on the things that I said I would do versus what I actually did. You know, we had a set schedule mm -hmm. and he said, Rob, I need the shower because our school starts earlier. And <laughs> I thought, okay, that makes sense. And so I got out and um, continued my shower afterwards because that's what I, that's what we planned. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about, I think, some of the, the, the mindsets that Clemens brought to the table was really, like, rigorous and fair. Well, and if you have three, three boys going through the same bathroom in the morning, I mean, you want to wanna have some order. Well, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. Cool. Cool. University. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I decided I don't want to be a translator or mm -hmm. a interpreter mm -hmm. or a teacher mm -hmm. at the time when I was 18 and just starting in university. And I started German because I loved it in school and excelled in it in eighth grade to senior year. I just, I just really, really loved it. And my teachers were fa fabulous. Shout out to Mrs. Canaan and Mr. Peters. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to study marketing and make German my minor. Mm -hmm. And the reason being, I've always wanted to be wealthy. I've always wanted to work with people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just want to be a teacher or a translator or an interpreter. I hadn't put in the thought before I chose that as my major. And so university was a, a, a fantastic time. And the business school taught me a lot. And my senior year, I got a, a, an email that said, Rob, do you want to work in Australia? I said, yep. <laughs> and so this, <laughs> we had been getting 10 emails a week about, you know, smuckers or logistics or, you know, key bank and P and G, et cetera. Our school was quite established in the business mm -hmm. sense. And so I went to the information session. The woman was a redhead. Uh, and she said, she said, here's a Tim Tam. And I had no idea what it was, but it's like their Oreo. And mm -hmm. I had, I had one and it was absolutely delicious. And then I asked her, uh, what does a redhead mean in Australian? And, you know, do they have a word for it? And she said, yep, it's rhino. And I said, great, what does that mean? <laughs> she said, orangutan. Oh, I was like, oh, that's great. I, I, was, I was hooked from, from then on. I, I, th I just thought it a, a, a great novelty that they would bring these, this cookie. And I really liked their pre presentation style. So I got a letter of intent. Uh, September of my my senior year and then moved to Australia in August of the le of the next year mm -hmm. and so yeah that was the beginning of Brisbane Queensland Australia for me for, for three years wonderful and how, how was how what are like differences that you perceive from like living in Australia to living in Cleveland Ohio mm. or near Cleveland Ohio yeah Firstly, it's much sunnier. Yeah. It's much hotter. Mm -hmm. The people have different priorities. Where I would say surfing and bushwalking or taking hikes is ingrained in the culture. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't think in America, in the Midwest, we have that many outdoor activities mm -hmm. that are so ingrained. And I would say that not having guns was amazing. And you really don't realize it until you're not in a place where you can have a conceal and carry license. And I, I just admired that. It was also very strange to watch America's politics and culture play out mm -hmm. from the outside. Mm -hmm. I thought it quite a farce, quite a, a joke you make on the elevator to work. Like, uh, how about that election? <laughs> or, you know, how about this? And, so that was very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Once I left, I got to look in and I'd never done that before, I'd never had the chance. Yeah, one sees, one reflects on your own culture a lot different. You see different things once you're outside, right? Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Absolutely. Um, like lots of artists, like Hemingway and Miller and whatever. I mean, like it was a whole tribe, not, not tribe, the whole group of of um, writers 
exile in the US in the 20s, in the 1920s, uh, and all went to Paris because it was very nice and very different and very cheap to live. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is where they formed their perception about the US um, from a different angle. But that's, well, it's a truism. It's um, nothing that we have invented here. Mm. But it's still nice to experience. I, I, exp I re recall my own experience when I um, went to study in my, my foreign year in the US and um, have been like German or European the first time in my life, so mm. to speak, um, insisting on Vollkorn Brot and uh, <laughs> I mean baking it myself. At this time, there was no Whole Foods uh, around. And stuff what, like, like hearty this. whole grain bread? Yes, and... Um, Not Schwabels. <laughs> yes, and, and seeing and, and being astonished that health insurance was something to debate. Mm. Um, because nearly everyone has one in, in Germany. I mean, if you're employed somewhere, that's it's mandatory anyways then. It's only if you're very rich, whatever you can, it's, it's not mandatory anymore. Mm. And actually moving to, to, to Switzerland, um, it is even stricter here. Uh, once you register, you can't just move, right? You, you register so people know, I mean, the government knows who, who lives where, basically. And um, like 10 days later, you get a letter informing you that you have to register at a health insurance. And those are the major ones, blah, 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 blah. But what is easy about it is that there is a strict legislation about like the base coverage. So it's very easy for you as a customer just to pick one because more or less it's a little bit of a price difference. But for, you know, breaking your leg or having a regular cancer or mm. this, whatever, um, the coverage is more or less the same. It's only if you want to have, you know, um, you want to choose the surgeon or you want to ha always be in a room without other patients or whatnot, mm. you pay extras. Mm. But for your care, it's really simple. Mm. So anyways, so much so, for the differences you perceive when you're outside. Right, where the baseline is covered in yeah. Europe and in Australia, there's I, I saw bulk billing where it's basically What's just that? a term. It's a term for it's free. So if you go to a GP and you, it's bulk billed. You give them your Medicare card and it's free. Not okay, for foreigners. But, okay, but who pays for Medicare? The government. All right, so it's like from the taxes, basically. That's right, yeah. 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 And I don't know a lot about it. I might be speaking some, somehow falsely. But what I, the point I wanted to make was similar to what you said about if you can specialize whether you're in a room by yourself or which doctor you can yeah. pay extra. But the care yeah. is is like a cornerstone of that of that mm -hmm. society. In America, it's not. And in Australia, when I saw that, I was very surprised and thought, why why isn't that the case in America? And another point. Well, I think it's can I drop? Yeah, of course. I think it's a philosophical question. What what role you want the government to have? Mm. And um, I thought a little bit about this when I was teaching future students, uh, few future teachers um, about the role of, of government. And I think the philosophy in, in Europe to, to a bigger or lesser degree is whenever a company or whenever you, you are about to make mistakes that put you at a really big risk or the pe put people at a really big risk government is sort of as is, is sort of involved mm. it's the same in the US for drugs i mean why would you have an fda why, why would you have an agency that proves drugs mm. well you as a singular patient or client or customer you can't evaluate whether this drug works or not and what the side effects are right mm. um, so you like um, you delegate this basically to the government, government because government doesn't want everyone to die from X, Y, and Z. Mm. So, and if you transfer this to other areas, well, you say, we want you, we force you to have health insurance because we know if you have to have a very um, expensive operation, surgery, and you don't, you, you're not able to uh, afford it yourself, 
at the end of the line, if you don't have much family or whatever, you're landing in poverty on the street or whatever anyways. And mm. we kind of want to prevent that. Mm. It's not that it's totally made easy because it's the people who work, who, who's, who afford the system. I mean, um, but another example is, for example, legislation on financial products. Mm. A lot of products that I see, for example, with the housing industry um, in the US would not be allowed in, in, in Europe because the financial industry, no, the financial super visual government agency says, you know, there are people who are not really smart. They are born with not the super high IQ. Do we want them to really be sucked out and be broken with, you know, false promises that they, uh, of which they don't grasp the falseness in the sense of someone, someone says, you, you can also afford a house. You don't have to pay anything like the next year. It's only 10% interest the year after. Right. And it's only 12% the year after. Mm. And you and I know that, oh, alarm, alarm, we, we won't be. Um, but as a person who's not that smart, um, you would fall into that trap. Mm. So products like this don't exist mm. in Switzerland, Germany, and whatever. I don't know when, how it is in Italy and Spain, but and stuff like this exists in the US. And I think philosophical question is how much do you let the market play it out mm. to what kind of risk and then I think with the housing industry you see that the freedom that exists in the US does have a big price on the other side because it it forces well companies are revenue driven right or mm. profit driven so it forces it makes them force people into like you know ruining their lives and i think how much you want to prevent this mm. is a philosophical question i think yeah there's more government involved in in obviously also in australia mm. so what i'm hearing is like these uh these uh herausforderungen this this challenge mm -hmm. is do we give it to how much do we give that to the government to decide to protect yeah. against the con yeah. you're saying that in, in europe they protect against the con or the scam more than they do in America, yeah. which is yeah. more free flowing. Yeah. And you prefer the former. Well, it's a, I think you always, you always have to say, I mean, you have, well, you have to, to make your check and balances with every new product in the sense of, um, I don't know. I mean, the world is changing all the time, right? With mm. bitcoins and blah, 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 blah. And, as, as we evolve, every, every time society has to think of, do we want to put a burden on that? Because grandma can be talked into X, Y, and Z, and is mm. this a good product? Mm. So, um, yeah, and you can say there is no law against stupidity. Yes, but why do we have the FDA then? Mm. Uh, and why do we put laws against heroin? You could also say let the market free float freely, right? Mm. Um, and there is not much of a difference, I think, between giving someone bad drugs and giving someone a financial contract on a house of which you know it's not going to happen. Mm. Very interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, but you get sorry, we're getting a little bit off track. It's so just interesting to, to talk to you. Absolutely. Um, so you're still in university and interested in German, obviously. And yep. marketing and well no you're not in it, uh, university you're in Australia mm. so and what what happens yeah Three yeah years in Australia yeah absolutely uh, when I arrived on uh, August 5th of 2015 I was surprised at the the strength of the Sun it felt like it was really beating down on me I could I had a couple layers of clothes and I could feel it on my skin. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm not in Kansas anymore. And that was the beginning uh, from the, yeah? Yeah, but that's August, that's winter. It's Australian winter. Absolutely, yeah. And still it was- Imminent, yeah, yeah. Wow. Absolutely, there's the ozone layer, it's a whole yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. right? And so the sun feels like, and me being a ginger doesn't help. <laughs> so 
from the way that they make their coffee, which is, I much prefer to okay. drip coffee in the States. They do it with pressure and with uh, like the stove cup mm -hmm. in the yeah, 50s. Yeah, Italian. Yeah, 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 migrants brought their stovetop coffee yeah. makers and that's True. how the barista guru culture of Australia started and their flat whites and their lattes and they loved, loved that culture. And having it with uh, mashed, smashed avocado and uh, poached egg in the morning. They love their breakfast. Uh -huh. okay. So things like this were just so uh, fun for me to dive into. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I'm having breakfast with my friends at this beautiful waterside cafe. Wonderful. So I think the, the topography, the geography, the freshness of the produce, and the sun... I think all were, were a really positive impact. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was just like, you know, like that face where you're just like, oh my, like, where am I? For the first few months I was cool. <laughs> from these awesome expeditions with other people my age and my company, we went on trips and camping and we went to islands and this is crags and this blue azure centurion water and the wind's blowing and the sun's out and I'm just like, where am I? This is insane. I've never experienced something like this and this is where I live now. So that that that's what Australia was like for me. It was it was it was it was beautiful. Mm. Hmm. And but now you're sitting here in Zurich is in my little studio and what's the transition now? Yeah, the transition is to architecture. It's to history. Australia was founded in the 1700s, 1800s, is where it started being, you know, uh, explored. And here it's much older. So the stories that are able to be told here, the difference from even city to city mm -hmm. versus in America where you drive for five hours and you might see a similar topography and hometown. Here you're going from, you know, Germany to France. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the storytelling is, is rich and, and deep and you can really sink your teeth into it. Okay, so what, what background do you have? I mean, how, what did evolve around like storytelling and mm. words? And yeah, I love reading. I've always had from a kid. We had a thing called Accelerated Reader in the fifth grade and I remember it like it was yesterday. You had 27 points you had to get per month. And I far exceeded that because I always read. And we had tests we had to take on the books to practice our proficiency. And it was one of the things I was most proud of as a child and probably started my love of words. From there, I went to writing competitions in middle school with shout out Mr. Spacek and Ian Kropp. We had, we had so much fun. We rep represented our school in states uh, in Ohio for writing competitions. Oh. Mm -hmm. You would have 45 minutes. It would give you a prompt like, Zero. Write a story about that word. Cool. And then we'd sit in a room and we'd scribble away and smudge our pencils with our palms and carbon paper so you can't write on it twice. And from there, it went to speech and debate in college. And that was where poetry really started. And we would dress up in suits and go to different schools and compete in uh, speeches or debates. Debate being Lincoln, Doug, Lincoln Doug, Douglas type debates, two on mm -hmm. two, or speeches being logos, ethos, pathos from, I believe it's Plato, um, informative and mm -hmm. entertaining and persuasive. And on the other side was poetry. Mm -hmm. And so we had 10 minutes, we cut five different poems from five different artists, tried to tell a story, and we were judged. And depending on your ranking, you could go to states and it was I mean I can't say enough good things about the forensics speech and debate circuit in America it's it's top-notch for learning how to speak mm -hmm. how to pur 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 purport yourself how to stand how to compete mm -hmm. I mean so many positive impacts from that and then in Australia uh, that's when poetry really started kicking off You have a special smile about that. So Absolutely. What, is, what does that mean? It, it sure. kicked off. It started with a Facebook ad. It started with a Facebook ad. All right. And I hadn't written much poetry up until now. It was 2016. And the ad said, uh, there's an Australian National Poetry Slam happening. I said, 
well, I can t- I've always wanted to do that. And so uh, I wrote a poem. And I always had an idea of the poem, type of poem I wanted to write. Um, it was exciting. And it took me about a month to write. And then I went to our first heat in Brisbane. They had heats all over the country in Victoria and New South Wales and Tasmania and et cetera. And, et cetera. and Man, it was so much fun. I memorized my poem. You can't have it longer than two minutes. There's five judges in the audience. Mm-hmm. It has to be your original work. It has to be the same poem every heat if you oh, move really? on. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And so the top two move on, and second and third place were tied, and I was one of them. And so <laughs> what they said was, well, let's have a dance-off. <laughs> what is that? A dance-off, meaning... You two will dance to music in front of the crowd, and by applause, we'll choose who wins. (laughs) All right. You better bet your bottom that I tried my absolute hardest at just going for it. And so I did, and I got to the next round, and man, it was so much fun. That was in... in (laughs) Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you very much. All right. So that was in Queensland. That was the state final, uh, the next round. Yeah. And... The top two moved on, and I got second place. And whew, was I so you as up. an American way like second place, Australian At poetry English. slam competition winner? Yeah, in Queensland. In Queensland. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey! All right, wonderful. And Congratulations! Then, thank you. I think that's a great accomplishment. Hmm. I appreciate it. And the last bit is Sydney. Mm-hmm. I had never been to Sydney, and. It was in the uh, in the Sydney Opera House where sixteen of us wow. performed wow. in front of a crowd of three or four of my friends, my then girlfriend, and my God, four thousand people. Yeah, something like this, and and one of my friends from high school. It was just insane. It was I I will never forget that for as long as I live. Sure. It was How could you? And I remember my girlfriend coming up. At the time, my, my friend Jeff, who I had been in high school plays with, and we both worked for the same company in Australia oh, really? after going to the same university. Okay. And I got to show him the backstage, and I felt so proud. And okay. it was just this, this, this cream of the crop moment showing Jeff and my girlfriend around the stage of the, at the Sydney Opera House. That was, I mean, you, you worked for I me, mean, you deserved it. Mm. It's, you worked for it and you deserved it. And so um, it's, it's um, very nice, a very nice moment for your story storage room, mm. so to speak. Something mm. you can tell your grandchildren. Um, so, and how's poetry doing today? I mean, what is, what is going on with poetry and words and what is the trajectory, so to speak? Maybe we, we can address it from the other way around. It's mm-hmm. 2000, what is it? 19 now. Um, let's make it 2030. You are in your late 30s and it's Christmas and you are happy about your successes. And what would be like the setting that you're going to to uh, enjoy your successes? And what would they be? They would be... community of one million people all involved in poetry across 20 countries and we would all be as many of us as possible maybe 100,000 of us would be in Greece and we would be celebrating the opening of, of this hub of the wordsmiths of the postcard tribe and it would be love and light and connection and we would be celebrating a a worldwide uh, opening of, of poetry, of word, of doing what we want, of a new type of community. What is what is poetry then doing for you? I mean, what is what is the function for you? It's not just you know nice words, right? I mean, something mm-hmm. 
that we had to memorize in school and it was boring because it was like 300 years old and you didn't <laughs> understand the German bar. Right. So uh, what is what is the function that you say or the, the role it can play or plays or whatnot? Mm. The role it plays is that it allows the audience to capture a piece that they get to keep permanently from the poet. Mm -hmm. When they hear someone speak their their truth which in its rawest form is language mm -hmm. and in its most artistic form by use of idiom metaphor simile illusion allegory alliteration onomatopoeia this is language in its in its prime mm -hmm. and when you listen to that you you get to keep that 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 nugget from that person so it's the best way for me as a poet to transfer what's going on up in the six inches between my ears through this portal and it's crunchy it's juicy it's out there and exotic and it makes you think and i just love inspiring wonder and surprise mostly wonder in people and that's what i'm about inspiring wonder a fully self-expressed world for me is stages on every corner where people of all ages are expressing themselves the kid is showing his lego the grandfather has his most prized gardening possession the mom shows her organization skills because that's what she loves that's that's what that's what poetry and performance is for me mm -hmm. like communication well and also and in, in inspiration and trans i mean transforming so to speak i mean yeah um i sometimes use the metaphor of holding huh how do you call this i don't know steigbügel that's the thing that you have at the side of the horse. I mean, where you put your feet in. A stirrup. Stirrup? Mm. So you're holding like the stirrup for someone else to, to get on a different horse, so to speak. It's like you're transporting, yeah. I love that. And the way you just used poetry, that's what I call poetry. You just used a fun, interesting, cool way yeah. for me to understand what's going on up there. And that's what I love about it. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that is like a stirrup. I yeah. would say on the shoulders of giants, but you say that, and that's just so Well, funny. I mean, we are living on shoulders of heroes and giants and maids, and not so much giants, but great parents or whatnot. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, because we are here, and obviously all of our, in our, all of our ancestors made it. Otherwise, we wouldn't sit here. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. So, well, yeah, I mean, we are, you are, and I am a success story. I mean, we have to... One has to make this, sometimes one has to bring this to attention because, yeah, a lot of people died like without kids and whatnot, but obviously all our ancestors made it, so something was right about them. Um, and I'm going hmm? to live a damn good life to honor them. Yes, That's I'm, I'm totally, absolutely sure about that. Inspiring, and you were talking about like, kids and uh, kids. getting getting the raw form of thoughts into finer form and more more not finer but refined forms of yes. of of wording and um, means mm. so to speak i don't know whether you know that i've been a school principal in a former career in an international school and then in a public school so um and I've always been interested in, in various forms of not only work on stage, because I really think it's a great means of um, making children stronger. Um, yeah, and make them ripe and not ripe, make them grow without someone, you know, uh, standing with a whip behind them but because they know at this given time they have to know their role right mm. or their piece or whatever mm. so um, if you could if you could just invent a plan if you were a minister of education in Germany or in Switzerland or whatnot 
not without like unlimited funds and not invent, reinventing schools, but what would you envision to to happen concerning like language and poetry or the other arts? I don't know. Yeah. And why? Cool. To make it not too simple. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would envision class time where you sit and a teacher says, Okay, this zero. is where yeah, <laughs> zero, exactly. Where where you have a prompt or it's simply create and we're creating they're the most successful graduate programs out there or teachers out there winning awards are giving this blank template. So I would give at least 45 minutes a day into creating that project, whether it's starting a comic book or whether it's uh, knitting coasters mm -hmm. or helping your mom build a cabinet that she's doing so by scratch in your garage. Uh, it would start there. It would start with, with really creating and giving more freedom and making it a community and talking about stuff mm -hmm. and doing so in a safe environment. Really know, having the kids know that I, I understand you and I can relate and let's go from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, wonderful. I don't want anything to be hidden under the rug. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly hesitating because I would, I would think whether I would call this safe because um, it is safe in the sense of it's just school, right? But if you're behaving bullshitty, you should be, I mean, it should be the normal inter interplay of like upright speech. Right. And so, but it's still school. It's, you can try yourself out as, as you said in high school and as I, I also did like leading groups and whatnot. I mean, you try your style and you try mm. how you, how you move on or not. So mm. it's, um, if a kid is like you said, acting up, then there's something that's, they're not being, there's something not being fulfilled at home is what I would say is one of the possibilities. Another one would be that they're not part of that would be they're probably not being understood. So without overstepping boundaries and talking about, I don't know, something that would be uh, illegal, I would create an uh, environment where things could be talked about. Yeah, that's wonderful. Things have to become to get on the table. Um, and I think, well, in psychology, you um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a truism that you get people to grow when you enable them to get out of their comfort zone, right? Mm. It's not that you make the world safer because the world is not going to change. Mm. Um, I mean, basically, um, although it has never been as safe as, pre as, as, as present. I mean, yeah, in medieval times, you had a lot more murder and you had a lot more like child abuse and you had a lot more blah, blah, blah. We just hear about it a lot, um, a lot more because everything is like texted and whatever uh, going viral in a, in a split second at present. But if you if you compare statistics, what happened in London in medieval times? I mean, if for for children, it's not fun. Anyways, um, but so you're saying the development of society would be a great thing yeah it's i know I'm, i want to support what you're saying things have to, have to get onto the table so you have I, i'm not yeah to finish the thought and it makes kids stronger if they have to defend their point mm. and um it not um always been yeah and not being too in, into too much of like a shelter i mean it's a shelter it's a it's a sort of like a safe space but still you have to learn to earn your credits and to speak your truth and defend it or then back up and say, ah, you have a point, so I have to change my opinion because your facts are better. Mm. Um, that's something that you have, to, well, that, that you hopefully you learn in school. And to wrap that up, I'll just say that when it comes to kids, I think many of us know that when you tell, a, tell someone we're going shopping today and you don't, then that's really noticed. Or they'll say five minutes before you said we'll go shopping at the time okay let's go and 
I think what I've learned is that kids notice much more and are much more free and self-expressed to say what needs to be said. So mm-hmm. what I want to avoid is their expectations or agreements being made with adults. I want the least amount of that to be broken mm-hmm. and the most amount of that to be fulfilled. And I want the ability, lastly, to have them be able to call each other out mm-hmm. on our word mm-hmm. and what we said. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right that integrity and speaking what you're thinking and acting out what you're speaking is like the fundamentals of role modeling um, because yeah period mm. Mm. Because and I don't think it's a moral thing I don't think it's your well it also is because it has well the world is a place for acting but a lot of things because we are not plants we are animals we are creatures of action and of movement and every time you move you make a decision to talk or to sit on the sofa or to sit in front of the tv whatever and it shows a hierarchy of the values that you have and it shows of what your life is about and whatnot so if your action doesn't match what you're saying this is well it creates friction somewhere in your psyche so to speak but also it makes it a lot harder for children to to learn that they for themselves have to develop this um those this capacity of um how do you call this belongs of shoot like um delay of gratification and all that kind of mm. stuff which That's comes cool. along with ah, now i have this appointment but i would rather have you know some ice cream or, or whatnot mm. But we said we would meet at four, so we have to leave the house, period. Right, right. Which is we're going to mess up, yeah. uh, mess up a lot. <laughs> and uh, so that's a great uh, example of like, sticking to your word. So um, now you're sitting in Zürich, and what is the trajectory? I mean, and we have some trajectory of a million people in 20 countries in 11 years, and meeting Greece then in 2030. Yeah, um, and crags and rocks and ocean and breeze and yes. tents. Um, and what is what is the way to there? What is in the next, I don't know, five months? And what is the next five years? Yeah, in the next five months, I will be building my freelancing um, content marketing specialist uh, skills mm-hmm. to then be able to afford being a digital nomad, which is a a location independent, a project I started in November. Mm -hmm. So three, almost, yeah, nearly three months ago to the day. That will allow me to live the lifestyle I want Mm -hmm. and the lifestyle that caters to my skills and words are still a, a very big part of that. And then I'll publish a poetry book Mm -hmm. and I will continue running events, uh, putting, putting on uh, events like poetry and continue writing and continue performing and finding other poets. It's not my main priority right now. My main Mm -hmm. priority is establishing my new career that Mm -hmm. I started three months ago Mm -hmm. and it's a still a big part of my life all right wonderful I'm going I'm very excited to to see how this trajectory how this project is going to evolve over over the next 11 years Mm -hmm. until we see each other in Greece Um, awesome and um, until then all the best hope to see you and um, talk to you on the bunten stool somewhere in between. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Anya. Most welcome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah.